Um, before presenting uh, the distinguished lecturers who will discuss Gidon's scientific contributions in different areas of hydrology, I'd like to say a few words myself, perhaps about the more human side of Gidon. Um, I met Gidon in 2010 uh, when I stepped into his office to ask about doing a PhD. Um, and I ended up stepping into that office perhaps uh, hundreds of times during the next four years. These meetings were fascinating, exciting, and inspiring encounters for me. Um, they often included Gidon telling an amusing story, a funny joke or interesting anecdote translated from various different languages. Um, it was truly a wonderful time, and I learned an um, incredible amount from my interactions with Gidon. Um, so these were also the years I decided I wanted to be an academic uh, myself and um, started to chart my own path in this world. So I'm taking this opportunity to thank you, Gidon, um, for those wonderful years. Having finished that chapter um, in my life, I also found out that Gidon is a great colleague and friend. And um, I think the best testimony for Gidon's outstanding character uh, is all the many people in our field of work who admire and adore him. Uh, many of them are here today. And um, finally, I think because it's not enough to do extraordinary, extraordinary science to have people truly adore you. It takes a very unique personality like Gidon's. I'm honored to introduce now the first invited speaker of the scientific part of this event, Professor Vladimir Tsvetkovic from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Vladimir, hold on, I have a few things to say. <laughs> Vladimir is a leading scientist in a few different fields of hydrology. He has made important contributions in modeling transport of reactive pollutants in aquifers. Part of these were in collaboration with Gidon during their 30 years of work together, which amounted to about 25 journal uh, articles. He's regarded as the leading researcher in the topic of radionuclide transport in crystalline rocks, a topic of interest for repositories of nuclear wastes. He will be talking about Gidon's impact on modeling radionuclide transport in fractured rock from the laboratory to the field scale. Vladimir, please. Yeah, um, well, it's uh, with great joy that I am the first speaker to celebrate my dear friend, Gideon. Uh, the, from the very original and, I mean, early works uh, on turbulent diffusion to uh, current times, there has been um, a key concept for understanding transport in turbulence, which is particles. And we believe that we understand uh, uh, turbulence as a physical, mathematical, also description. And nowadays, we have become pretty good in simulating this phenomena. So these are results of simulations. One characteristic of turbulence is that it's accessible. So whether you are in a wind tunnel or an ocean or the atmosphere, you can put your probe wherever you want and measure things quite easily. In contrast, if you go to the subsurface, it is inaccessible. We know, of course, there's some fantastic geology there. There could be some layering. We know there are maybe some gradients, so the groundwater is flowing. But if we try to look at this in any kind of detail, we really can get lost very easily because of this heterogeneity that geology is so well known for. So this has been kind of a challenge. How do we describe these systems that we really cannot see or access easily? So in these two seminal papers from 1982, Gideon laid the ground how to approach these problems. The first one addressing flow, second one transport, and this is just a conceptual simulation. And there have been many, many works since then that have used this kind of basic approach conceptualizations since then. And this is one example from fractured rock with trajectories and heterogeneity on, on various scales. Or they could be simulations. But whatever approach, and there have been many what is common to the ground that uh, Gideon has laid is that 
It's about trajectories. It's about a statistical representation of geology. And it is about uh, statistic analysis of flow. Now, if we look at each one of these, they were known before. In turbulence, there were trajectories. We, there was geology, geostatistics. Uh, and we knew how to study partial differential equations, stochastic partial. But putting all these three together um, in a theoretical framework was the key uh, breakthrough and step. But not only that, not only did Gideon lay the theoretical conceptual ground, he also provided work, workable hands-on tools that were actually useful for engineers. So there are many areas where this is relevant, and we will be hearing that during the course of, of these presentations. But one area that arguably is maybe the most important one, maybe, is the geological disposal of high-level nuclear waste. This story starts with Sherman Freed at the end of the 70s. He was a nuclear chemist. And together with a few colleagues from the Argo National Lab, he published a paper in Science with the title Retention of Plutonium and Americium by Rock. Now, what they did is they took a little sample of rock, five centimeters. They created an artificial fracture. They ran water through that fracture, injected plutonium and americium, and then they let it run for a while. And they opened it up, and then they mapped the activity. Based on that, they could see how fast the radionuclides are moving relative to water. What they did then is extrapolate this very bravely to scales of 20 kilometers and years 150,000 years, roughly. So what they did in this article is, is lay questions, issues. One is the upscaling. How do you go from five, five centimeters in the lab through a fantastic geology, totally unpredictable, to scales on kilometers. The second question was macro dispersion. They knew it was there. They used some simplified e expressions, quite naive, but that's the best they could do. But that opened up a topic that turned out to be pretty tough. And then how do you couple, you need to couple the flow and the transport with reactions with, the, in this case, sorption. So without knowing, Gideon just almost the same time, was actually addressing these very issues and laying the theoretical, physical basis for their deeper study. Now, based on this work, they drew the following conclusion. Little plutonium and americium can reach the external environment from a well-designed and isolated geological repository. The same year, there was a group of geologists that looked at the same problem, not experimentally, but they kind of did some calculations, analysis, and they agreed that they basically stated the same thing, but they said that in addition to the geological barrier, it would be good to also have an engineering barrier. Based on these two, the concept of geological disposal was born. Sweden was one of the first countries, if not the first, to take this concept and actually do a design. This is the so-called KBS-3 concept with three barriers. The clay barrier, the copper and canister, and the steel. This is still the working concept for the repositories which are currently being constructed. Very few, but nevertheless. So, this is what the future repository of Sweden may look like. And as you see, these are large scales. These are huge uh, uh, facilities, you can say, Poshmark. Um, and the result to arrive at this and to give a green light for the government were many, many studies that looked at trajectories, how they move from these potential repositories, reach the biosphere, 
numerical, analytical, there was just a huge amount of work that was based on these fundamental concepts that Gideon has given. If we look at a little bit more detailed map of the components that come in in this kind of safety assessment studies, we will find that Gideon's work was crucial for most of them, looking at transport and flow in single fractures, coupling to the reactions, discrete fracture network flow, transport, looking at this heterogeneity, parametrization of transport, looking at uh, uh, kind of uh, safety studies also based on trajectories. So, very important contribution. Finland was the first country to approve the construction of a nuclear repository. That was in 2015. That followed the decision in 2005 to construct a nuclear reactor. This was the first such decision in Western Europe after 15 years. And of course, you can argue that these two things go together because you need to close the fuel cycle, and that's like by the geological disposal. So you're taking out the uranium and mining it, you are processing it using the energy, then you need to close it. And Finns, as uh, practical, pragmatic they are, they were the first to do this and take this step. But the Finns are an exception. Many other countries went the other way. Here is the potential, what was once a potential repository site for the US, the Yucca Mountain. Many years of a lot of resources being invested in that facility, the tunnels, they were almost complete. And that program was terminated in 2009. And there was a very clear statement that this was not a technical step. It was a political step. We can also correlate that to the fact that nuclear power was not being developed in the US since around 2000. The power, the output was stagnating. So that went together, no development, no pressure for, the, for, the, uh, for resolving the, the nuclear waste. So what were the consequences of this? Well, obviously, the energy, the fossil energy, has been increasing steadily. The gas, the coal, the oil. And the nuclear energy here is just a tiny, uh, part or fraction of that. The consequence of that is that if we look at the temperature, global average temperature relative to the 60, 80 average, we are currently at the top of the tops. And if we just extrapolate this by assuming a 0.2% growth, which is the minimum probably, we are heading towards, let's say, 1.5 degrees at 2050. Now, if we could try to imagine, to reimagine history, go back and say that maybe there should have been a greater investment in nuclear energy from, let's say, the 19, between 90 and 2000, which could have followed, let's say, this line, replaced much of the coal, then it's everything else the same, the transport increase, everything, we would still be seeing a significant effect. And with a little more effort in, you know, lifestyles or something, we could be flattening this to maybe uh, 1.2 degrees. But that's where we are heading. So, to sort of conclude, uh, Sherman Fried laid the chemical basis for nuclear repositories, and Gideon Lagan laid the physical, theoretical, mathematical uh, basis for, uh, for studying this concept. The Finland, after 
how many was that? Let's say three and a half decades, was the first to approve a nuclear repository. And that should become operational in two years, the first one in the world. Sweden approved in 21, although they were the first to start. But they were dragging on, so here, that's where they made the decision. And the EU, at the same year, made this statement, basically saying the geological disposal of nuclear waste is the way to go. But a long time here, and I could claim that we knew this as a fact already around here. But in the meantime, the high-level nuclear waste isolation programs were canceled in many countries. They were on hold, put on hold, or reset, and they're kind of just starting from scratch. Effectively, there's been no development of nuclear power in the West. And as we said, this was not technical, it was not scientific, not even economical. It was a choice that was made by the society. So when we look at the human choices, human mind, then we're getting into a new territory. We know that people overestimate risks for things that they don't understand or think they cannot control. They underestimate risks severely for things that they believe they can control. And looking into the future, whatever investment that is, nuclear energy or whatever else we may be deciding upon, it's always a question of prospects, win or lose. And we know there are lots of heavy biases there. So this, of course, has been consequential throughout human history. So, uh, but without now uh, dwelling upon the missed opportunities, we look at the future and try to see it in a bright way. 2022, the EU declares nuclear energy as a green energy. So now, maybe with this decision and with this decision, we maybe are set to develop this capacity or this more. But that remains to be seen. So maybe it's too late, too little too late, but we will see. So here, I just want to say that Gideon, as a scientist, did what he does best. He laid this ground. The studies were done massively, massively. We had the knowledge already here, but there was no will because of the workings of the human mind. So you did your job. Thanks, Gideon. But the rest is psychology. And thank you.